Final segment on today's Jefferson Exchange. I'm Jeffrey Riley. Thanks for listening. The triple-digit temps of late make us want to hide in the shade. The sun is great for plants here in the heart of growing season. The heat, well, that might be another story. We always have lots of questions about tending to the needs of plants. Lynn Kunzman of Jackson County Master Gardeners makes more frequent visits during the summer to answer our questions in a segment we call Garden for Life. Hi, Lynn. Hi, how are you doing? Doing well. Lynn is live, so get your questions in for now or for the next segment at jx at jeffnet.org. So let's, uh, since we started talking about triple-digit temperatures, let's talk about that. Plants, as we've observed in the past, do slow down a bit in the heat, don't they? They do. Um, Oftentimes, things like the summer veggies will stop setting fruit during those really high temps. Um, If it gets up more than about above 95, they, they kind of, they just go, oh, no, we're just, we're stopping. (laughs) <laughs> but um yeah uh, no but point trying to coax them back have to plenty of fruit set mm-hmm. already on their peppers and tomatoes there should be lots of fruit already set so uh it's not going to delay getting a harvest <laughs> okay that's good to know yeah i only got two tomatoes yeah. set on the on the one vine so, uh, so, right. so uh, yeah no no point in trying to coax them to, to, to get any more aggressive when it's this hot i take it no but you can you know you can i you can shake your tomatoes to make sure that they're, the flowers are pollinating themselves. Oh, yeah. If you're having p- trouble with pollinators, I would recommend people go out and shake their tomatoes and, and even their peppers and eggplants to get that pollen uh, moved around in those flowers. Um, I've noticed a lot fewer bees in my garden this year, so um, you know, a lot, lot fewer natives and a lot fewer honeybees. So a uh, good thing to just give the plants a little shake. Right. I'd forgotten about that. Yeah. We, in fact, a couple of us yeah. who were growing tomatoes in the newsroom talked about that. Like, yeah, I just went out and knocked our plants together for a while. Yeah, Don't be right. too aggressive. Just, just give, them a little, give them a little shake. Rattle their cages a bit. Uh, <laughs> That'll work. Uh, should yeah. we be adjusting watering at all, either up or down when it's this hot and the plants are, uh, are well, kind of snoozing? Yeah, it depends. It depends on what you're doing. If you are if you are, you know, if your plants are looking heat stressed, then certainly you want to adjust up. Um, but for things like, um, potatoes, if the tops are starting to die, um, and your garlic or, um, um, other alliums, if they're look, starting to, tops are starting to brown out, you want to decrease water because you're going to be harvesting those. And so you want them to kind of toughen up. And, um, this, this month is when you're going to be pulling your garlic and, uh, allowing it to air dry, um, and then braiding it yeah. up or hanging, however you're going to store it. Um, and the, and potatoes, once the tops begin to brown out, um, then you can pull those and harvest those. Okay, we have uh, an email here from uh, from Shelley, uh, I think on the Oregon coast, um, no town given, but uh, with a couple different parts that I may come get to several of them. Uh, uh, first question is about soaker hoses. Shelley wants to know if they're reliable. Um, talks about sizes, which diameter and length are best to use, how many can be connected. Um, if you use them on a grade, does more water distribute at the lower end? So a bunch of things like that about soaker hoses. Well, which yeah, you... so, so soaker hoses are a little problematic. They, they have a very narrow width of coverage, right? So you have to really place them about a foot apart so mm-hmm. that you're getting full coverage across a bed. If you've got like a three or four foot wide bed. Um, if you're going just down a row, then a soaker hose is a great option, you know, um, uh, but I wouldn't put more than, you know, even a hundred foot soaker hose is a, that's a pretty long, uh, demand. And she's right. Uh, the further down, if, if you're on a grade, the, the, um, the water's going to get delivered more heavily to the lower part of the, of the grade. Um, you know, my husband and I now are, we're overhead watering in our garden because our lot slopes so much. The soaker hoses were just dumping everything down at the bottom and, and the top part of the lot, the vegetable garden was drying out. So we, we've gone, and they, they do, soaker hoses have a life. You know, they, they get clogged. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you've got minerals in your water, you're watering from a well, that's really problematic because wells have a lot of mineral and kind of grit material that comes through that water sometimes going directly into an irrigation system. And, um, and so the, the pores in those hoses get clogged. Um, so you got to you got to check them. You got to change them. You got to watch for even there are even some little ants that if you leave them out during the season uh, over the winter, ants will drill holes into them and make foams in them. 
So. Oh wow. <laughs> you got to Yeah, they're they're uh, you know they're, they're a nice dark place for things to go and so. Um, yeah, and I've noticed the occasional soaker hose that uh, that springs a leak, and you got the, instead of just the the sweating thing going on, you have this little one, you know, one little jet a coming little up. A little fountain, a fountain, and that means that then the pressure all down the line is not going to be adequate. You know, so yeah, you really have to you have to monitor them. You have to keep on top of them and and, and make sure they're functioning properly. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I also noticed too that if uh, if it gets a little muddy where you've been using them, for, for one thing, you're overwatering probably. But the other thing is that right. uh, if the mud gets encrusted on there, those that's also going to block up. Uh, yeah, they clog up. They can clog up from the inside or the outside. So you mm-hmm. gotta you gotta make sure you're monitoring them. All right. The other uh, one of the other questions that Shelley had was about uh, um, uh, using uh, Reme, which is a crop cover cloth for bug protection. Right. Um, mm-hmm. Shelley lives in the, the foothills of the Coast Range, three miles from the ocean. Says I use Reme for keeping the cabbage moth at bay for the first month or so on my cruciferous vegetables, but I'm concerned I'm increasing the heat level and might cause the plants to bolt as I transplanted them in mid-May. What do you think? Uh, there shouldn't be that much of a problem. Um, going on there. Um, I, I've never known those cold crops to bolt like that, but but um, especially on the coast. I mean, they do here inland. Uh, yeah, I I um, I mean, keep it on for as long as as you want to keep the the little butterflies at bay. But um, uh, I don't think it's going to be an issue um, with overheating if she's if she's close to the close to the ocean. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't know, though, with temperatures going up. So, I mean, I, that's, you, it's, you're going to have to play around with that. Yeah. How, how much do you find in the last five or ten years going, okay, well, I'm used to doing this, but that doesn't seem to be the book anymore on this process because the climate has changed? Yeah. I, You know, it's, it's just so weird now from year to year. Like last summer was just horrifyingly hot and everything in the garden was all wacky um this year because of the long cool June that we had i mean relatively speaking uh you know um things have been doing fine um so it it you just kind of have to monitor your plants all the time and um and make adjustments based on um you know whether we're having 90 degree june mm-hmm. or <laughs> you know 70 degree june well, I, I, we're talking to a Lynn Kunzman here on Garden for Life once again on the Jefferson Exchange. We are live this time. We have some time to take your emails if you want to get them into jx at jeffnet.org. I do happily save them for our next meeting with Lynn. We are talking more frequently in the summer. Uh, so to the, the, to the point of, of uh, not just the plants wilting, but the gardeners as well, um, you do need to get out there. You, you know, pick your time, obviously, to... to to not kill yourself in the in the sun and the heat, but but you do need to, to pay attention to what's going on in the garden, and I notice that you know. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So so I recommend people go out early, early in the morning and monitor everything, and then late in the evening when the sun is low, low on the horizon, so you're not, you know, blasting yourself. Um, but it's real important because you know it, uh, again it's squash bug season, and and if people need to do any spraying, they need to do it way early in the morning before the, the bees are flying or way late in the evening, you know, as the sun is setting after the bees have, have gone to bed <laughs> and they're in the ground and they're safe from whatever you might be applying to get rid of the other nasty things that are eating all your vegetables. Um, so, yeah, but, but monitoring your plants, um, and it's easy to go out and see after a day's heat what plants are suffering and, and, you know, may need more water mm-hmm. uh, or even shade cloth. I mean, there, there are, there are times when it's appropriate to put shade cloth over a garden area. Mm-hmm. You know, if the plants are really having, they're really struggling. Um, I, I don't see that as a, a, a problem at all. If you, if you're into that and you can afford it, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, to give them some shade cloth when the temps get up to into triple digits. You know, and it seems like, uh, particularly when it comes to watering, a, a little change can make a big difference. Uh, when I uh, took off uh, for vacation recently, I upped the the watering time by just a few minutes on the on the timers, right. and uh, and boy, a couple of plants just looked great when I got back. Yeah, no, it's it's. I mean, the plants will appreciate the water. There's no doubt about it. Uh, I mean, even native plants appreciate 
uh, extra water in in the really scorching heat. So it's um, it's sometimes important to to monitor it on an ongoing basis. We've upped our water a couple times now since June or you know since the since early June because it was obvious that um, the the ground we dig down in the garden and the soil was not moist down low and so we decided we needed to add more water and um, it's good to dig down and see if you've got a soil moisture meter use that or otherwise just take a trowel and dig down and mm-hmm. see how deep is that water actually getting you know if it's only getting in the top inch of soil it's really not helping plants that have their roots down four or five inches yeah, if, you, yeah. if your hand comes up sticky and pasty at three inches, but you stub your uh, your uh, your finger at five inches, it might not be enough. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to come back to uh, Shelley's uh, the final part of uh, Shelley's email. Uh, Shelley from the coast um, talks about uh, fertilizing. Is asking about the idea of fertilizing and watering at the same time. Uh, notices that uh, one siphon in particular does not recommend using it with drip or soaker hoses. Um, she talks about using fish emulsion, but I mean, is is is, is basically is watering and fertilizing a separate pr- right. uh, pair of processes? Well, yeah, they are separate activities, and you do, you definitely don't want to put fertilizers through any kind of a drip system. Um, I mean, unless you're using a totally soluble chemical, you know, Miracle Grow type fertilizer, mm-hmm. they'll go through because they're ionized. But if you're using any kind of an organic fertilizer, do not put it through your drip system. It will clog everything. Those are, those are organic, large organic molecules and, 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 um, and bits of, of uh, debris that are going to clog things up. So what we recommend is that you water first uh, to get the soil moist so it carries the fertilizer down and then go back and hand fertilize um, you know, put it in a watering can, fertilize each plant individually if you've got a small enough area. Or um, sometimes, sometimes some of those liquid fertilizers will work in the hose attachment sprayers. Mm-hmm. But I've had very bad luck with those. I I do it by hand with a watering can because the holes are big enough for those um, organic fertilizer, you know, fish emulsion type things mm-hmm. to get through. I've found that they clog up the uh, hose sprayers as well. So um, yeah, I recommend doing it by hand. Well, and then you know it gets to the the issue again. You know, I've been following the uh, the, the gospel of uh, fertilize weekly, weekly W E A K weekly, uh, and on a right. weekly basis. But then I started questioning right. my fertilizer choice too, because I was reading something about you know this. You use a four ten ten for this N P K nitrogen, um, phosphorus, and potassium. Is, it is potassium, right? Right. Okay. And yeah. uh, but then mm-hmm. I realized I have a four four four, and I thought, am I ready too weekly to be <laughs> to be thinning it out any further? Oh. Um, no, probably not. I mean, I, I, I think if, if you're fertilizing, uh, regularly, it, it, we use out at extension, we use like the organics that are like two, one, one, or, you know, so if you're using a, a four, ten, four, um, and you're diluting that, which is important, but mm-hmm. it, it, because you're, you're actually applying more fertilizer with those higher rated um, fertilizers, really important to read the label and see how often it tells you to fertilize at full strength and just back that off to half strength and do it twice as often. That really is important to read the label on your, um, on your, on your stuff. You know, the organics tell you to do it every other week. And so that's where weekly, weekly comes from. We do half strength every week, mm-hmm. um, which is half strength twice as often. Okay, so, so so think about it as a dosing kind of thing, like yeah, basically right. if you're like taking ibuprofen for yourself or something, yeah, okay, right, exactly. Oh, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. As as does so much of what you tell us. I always appreciate it. Lynn Kunzman from Jackson <laughs> County Master Gardeners joining us for another edition of Garden for Life. Good to have you back. Nice to be here. Bye. Right, talk to you soon. That'll do it for today's exchange. We are online at jeffexchange.org. Angela Decker, JPR News, is our senior producer. Charlie Zimmerman, now the assistant producer. Zach Beagle at the controls today. Maxwell and Terry Longshore composed our theme music. I'm Jeffrey Riley. Thanks for listening. Take care of yourself. Stay safe and have a great day.